Well, hello, friend. Welcome to your show, Rediscover, where we take some time to mine God's Word in, other to, in order to extract some valuable lessons. My name is Miguel Mendez, and I have the pleasure of serving as one of the associate pastors at the Loma Linda University Church in Loma Linda, California. Today, I am excited to continue our series on the Decalogue. That list of 10 commandments, 10 rules and regulations created by God for your protection, and why not? Your enjoyment. Now, I know I've told you before that I have two children. The eldest is Micah, and he's about to turn eight. And my youngest is a precocious bundle of joy who is getting ready to turn two. We call him Kai. And when Micah was growing up, he was very anxious to have another sibling. Now, he would ask Linda and I all the time, Mom, Dad, when are you going to have a child? When am I going to have a baby brother? Now, what Micah didn't know is that Linda and I found it very difficult to conceive. And so we wanted to temper his expectations. Now, after much prayer and some thoughtful consideration, we began trying, and thankfully, after about two years, we had a baby. Now, my question was, what shall we name him? Because after all, names matter a lot. Think about yours. Whatever name you were given was placed there through a process of thought and prayer and maybe even some dreaming and some considering. Now, when we wanted to find a name that encompassed everything we felt for this new baby, we decided to name him Malachi. Now, Malachi, as many of you know, means messenger. And so our dream for our new baby boy was that he would serve as a messenger of both love and peace into our family. Added on to that was the fact that Micah had been praying for a sibling for a long time. And so we wanted him to understand that Malachi was a messenger, a messenger of God's quick response to fervent prayer. Again, I want to remind you of that reality. May names mean a lot. And with this in mind, I'd like you to turn your Bible now to the book of Exodus. And we're going to be, as we have been in chapter 20, and we're going to focus today primarily on verse 7. That's again Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. Now, the commandment is actually rather short and rather simple. And it reads like this. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Now, often we've thought that this commandment actually is a prohibition against swearing. Or using some language that is not adequate. And while that is partly the rationale behind it, if we mine and we dig a little bit deeper, we will come out with a wonderful, wonderful, precious lesson that God is trying to instill on us. But first, let's deal with what we all agree on. I was driving on the freeway a few weeks ago, and I saw a wonderful sign posted on the side of the road. It simply read, if you are going to curse Use your own name, yours truly, God. I find it that it's very easy to let our language and our discourse begin to decompose itself, begin to become a violent and vitriolic attack against those who disagree with us. And we throw around words that are hurtful. That old saying, sticks and stones may bruise my bones, but words when it will never hurt, isn't really true. Words have the power both to build up and to destroy. And so at the outset of the commandment, God is asking his people to use caution and care when they speak. To not speak irrationally. To not speak out of passion to not speak words that will destroy. Now, I know that sometimes this is challenging, particularly if you have a certain personality type. Now, Linda and I are completely different. 
We've got very different temperaments, very different personalities, very different ways of looking and understanding life. And so when we got married, we began to try and figure out how to have thoughtful discussion that didn't devolve into a discourse that was violent and virulent. The problem was that in my house, typically, evenings were marred by discussions between my parents, discussions that, try as they may, I was ultimately brought into. My wife, on the other hand, believed that, believes that the best way to deal with discord is to simply hash it out, to have those difficult conversations in a clear manner that is actually done in a time and place as quick as possible. Now, here's where it got tricky. I have a personality type that is conflict averse. And Linda wanted to deal with the conflict right then and there. And so very early on in our marriage, we found that when we had a disagreement, she wanted to discuss it and I wanted to take some time to cool off. Now, she read my aversion to conflict as an attempt to abandon her while I read her need to hash it out in the moment as a desire to simply have conflict for conflict's sake. And so the first couple of years in our marriage were punctuated by this reality. Namely, I would walk into the house, Linda would say, we have to talk about it, and I would run away, and she would run after it. Can you picture it? us living in our little 500 square foot apartment trying to get away from each other where she fervently and feverishly chased me. Well, obviously that wasn't the best way of handling our words. And so God gives this command to his own community. His community learning the intricacies of a marital relationship between them and the God who set them out of Egypt. And he says, take care of the language you use. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Now, here's what I find interesting. The actual Hebrew translation of our English word misuse is varied and rich. The word itself can mean carry up, take upon yourself and have it become part of your identity. And in essence, this is what God is attempting to tell the people of Israel. Do not take upon yourself my name. Find it interesting that God isn't only interested in having us have discord and discourse that is as loving and as attentive as possible. No, God is also interested in us being authentic. A study was released a few years ago, and it dealt with the questions and the perceptions that we have about Christians. After much research, the researchers recognized that the primary complaint against Christians is that we are viewed as hypocritical, as inauthentic. We take upon ourselves all these wonderful realities. But when the rubber meets the road, we are incapable and, in and unable to deliver on this promises and this lofty language that we typically use. The ideals that Jesus instills in us, love, compassion, mercy, understanding, are sadly never enfleshed in the real realm of time and space. And so God says, take care about ascribing to yourself my name. Why? Well, as we've been studying, the Ten Commandments serve as the constitution for the people of Israel. In essence, this was to be the ultimate experiment of what a co-mutual relationship between God and human beings ought to look like. Now, immersed in all of that is this idea 
Israel had been chosen not for Israel's sake, not to lord it over the other nations, but rather Israel had been chosen in order to serve as a blessing to every other nation. To the Canaanite gods, to the gods of Egypt, to the Sumerian gods, Yahweh was to serve as a God that emptied himself out. A God whose being is in becoming. And the idea was that Israel would then take that message of, of a God that accepts you as, a, as you are, a God that is interested in serving you, a God that is interested in loving you, a God that wishes to redeem you, and that that message and that narrative would spread like wildfire throughout the earth. In essence, Israel's constitution had as its primary intent to bless every other nation. And then, then this God who is madly in love with humanity decides to use people as partners in this enterprise. The enterprise of story crafting. The enterprise of sharing this incredible vision. But the problem is that sometimes the partners, the emissaries, are not worthy representatives of the king. And so God, at the very outset, is trying to tell the people, take care with the language you use. Because my name is a name that introduces a wondrous new possibility into this world. It starts at the very beginning of the book of Exodus. Can you remember? God says to Moses, I am your Lord, your God, and I have heard the cry of my people, and I have decided to act. And Moses fearfully asks God, if they ask me, Lord, who sent me, what shall I say? And God gives him a name. He says, I am who I am. Or depending on your preference, I will be who I will be. Now that isn't just semantics, friends. In essence, God is saying, I am the originator of all reality. I am that which causes the earth to rotate on its axis. I am the, I am the one who is in charge of changing the seasons. I am the one who spoke the universe into existence, and I care about the plight of this people. That's my name, loving redeemer, merciful God, mighty in battle. This is who I am. Now go and speak truthfully about me. You see, faith and religion ought not to serve as excuses to take upon ourselves the banner of God's name and then use it to, to promote our own ideas or to propose our own goals. We are first and foremost to be faithful representatives of that God who says, come one, come all. And so God says, be careful with taking upon yourself my name. For when you do, it carries with it responsibilities. Now, the ancient Israelites understood this well. And that is why later on in the book of Exodus in the 26th chapter, you have this beautiful vision where Aaron puts upon himself on his ephod and his breastplate the 12 tribes of Israel, each one of their names inscribed in the priestly garments. And the purpose for this is, in essence, when, God, when Aaron appears before God as a priest interceding for his people, he is carrying upon himself the burden of all the people. He has taken upon himself the identity of the people. He is recognizing that people are broken. That people are messed up, that people often stray, but that with the God that speaks grace and mercy, there is always the opportunity for reconciliation. 
And so Aaron takes upon himself that load. And now God says, just as you, Aaron, just as the priest takes upon himself the loads of the people, you as an individual citizen of this new wondrous kingdom, take upon yourself the load of being a faithful representative of me. So don't use religion to exploit. Don't use faith as an opportunity to find divisions. Don't craft and create a language where the name of God is used to harm and hurt others. Be careful with how we speak about God. Friends, this is much more than simply not swearing. This has to do with you living up to your identity, to your call. To be an adopted son or daughter of the king of the universe and to use that last name appropriately. So you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Now the word that appears at the end of this commandment is the Hebrew word shah. And that particular verb has also many interpretations. The English language has translated as vain. But the interpretation is much more poignant than that. For you see, shah means something that is empty. Something that is devoid of all reality. It is a word that is often attributed to the idols. And again, at the heart of this commandment is a struggle. The struggle for the heart and soul of the Israelite people. You see, Israelite shifts And the people began to move from being a pastoral economy to an agricultural economy. And as this happens, they are confronted with the many deities in the Canaanite pantheon. Now, life in the ancient Near East is tenuous and precarious at best. It is a fickle cycle that controls existence, drought, and rainfall. And your life hangs in the balance. And so you want to ensure as best you can that your crops will be successful. As Israel begins to shift And as they focus on planting and harvesting, something interesting begins to happen on the countryside. Israelite households began to worship Canaanite deities. Archaeologists have discovered shrines to Asherah and Astarte all over Israelite-occupied land. They have also discovered these enormous pillars of rock that were supposed to function as family places of worship, where the, God, where the worship to God, Yahweh, the God who hears the plea of the people, was intermingled with worship to Canaanite deities. Their worship services included a healthy mix of syncretism, If you've read your Bible at any time, you will recognize that idol worship was prevalent in the Old Testament and that that was the primary problem that God was trying to address. Now, why do I say all of this? Because I find it interesting that the way that he concludes the third commandment is a reference to something that is devoid of all reality, something that is vain, Something that is vacuous and superfluous, an idol. Now think for a moment with me on the two, about the two commandments that just preceded commandment number three. 
the commandment to not have any other gods before Yahweh, and the commandment to not create any images. If you think hard enough, you're going to realize something is happening. God is actually trying to draw a clear and concise line between the expectations that people have about him and the reality that he has come to enact. And wouldn't it make sense that the expectations in theology, commandment number one, don't have any other gods before me, and the expectations in praxis don't create any images, would ultimately find their fullest expression in the language they use. Don't utilize the same language that you would to describe idols to refer to me, the one true God, the one who has delivered you from Egypt. Hmm. I wonder how that would have been read and understood by the people there huddled around Mount, Mount Sinai. I wonder if they recognized the implication the implication that would be made clear with the call of Amos and Hosea. The realization that our sacrifices don't matter. That our rituals are nothing if they are devoid of righteousness. I wonder if they would have heard echoes of that Nazarene rabbi as he said that the Sabbath was not made for man. as a burden, but rather that man was given the gift of time and rest with the Creator. I wonder if they heard the ancient seer standing at Patmos recognizing that what ought to signify and separate the 144,000 chosen one is that they have decided to follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And I wonder if you can hear it. The idea that the language we use and the things that we say about God have ramifications. And that those ramifications mean that we have to be responsible with the language we decide to utilize. That if we take upon ourselves the name Christian, and the designation of sons of God, what we say bears meaning and has repercussions. I wonder if we dare and recognize those ramifications. I did. Just this week, I did. I was driving to school with my son. And we were talking. And my son told me that someone in his classroom was not being nice to him. Now my eldest, Micah, is a sweet, soft-spoken boy. And so as he was telling me the story, my heart began to break a little bit. And I know if you've ever had children, you know what that means. You as a parent want to do nothing more than to protect them. Micah would tell me that this group of students at his school began to shun him. That they wouldn't invite him and draw him near when they would play at recess. Oh, how my heart broke. And then finally, I looked at him. And I said, so son, what are you going to do about it? And he said, well, dad, I know I have to forgive them. I know I have to love them. I know I can't fight with them. I know I can't argue with them. And I said, well, why not? And he said, because I'm your son. Because everyone knows that my name is Micah Mendez. 
and I am Pastor Mendez's son. And everything I do in class, Daddy, reflects on you. And I don't want people in my school to think that you haven't taught me how to be compassionate. And I don't want people at school to think that you haven't shown and modeled grace for me. I know that I am your son, and I know that people know you're a pastor. And if you're a pastor, and I'm a pastor's son, then that means I have to go the extra mile. And friend, my heart broke. You see, I'd always heard about the pressure that pastor's kids suffered through, but now for the first time ever, that became transparently clear. And I said, oh, son, I love you. And I stopped the car and we pulled over on the side of the road and I looked in his little face and I said, you don't have to be perfect for me. And he said, no, daddy, I know. I know I don't have to be perfect for you. But I want people to give you a chance. Be careful not to misuse the name of God. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. I've often thought what it was about the Pharisees that drove Jesus to such anger. And I recognized what it was. Standing there on the side of the freeway, I finally got it. See, what drove Jesus crazy about the Pharisees is that they spoke empty words about God. That they wanted to take upon himself the title of their of sons and daughters. That they wanted to take upon themselves the title of the most righteous, but they were unwilling to deal with the responsibility. And that decision was leaving people out of the kingdom of heaven. And that decision had forced them to create idols of everything. And that decision had pushed them to speak empty words about the God who loves. I hope that as you encounter people in your life, you might be able to speak openly and compassionately about that God. May God bless you today and always.